Chapter 10 The Great War Despite his immense loot, Rockefeller lived in fear of poverty, and he instilled this fear in his offspring in such intense degree that his fear of poverty has become a fixed paranoid characteristic of the dynasty. Rockefeller yearned above all things for security for himself in his piracy. This meant to him that he must loot and despoil everyone, enslave the world, and rob everyone else of their possessions and security in order to make sure that no one more ruthless and criminal than himself could arise and rob him of his loot. Like an ugly and monstrous spider, John D. sat in the midst of a vast sea of conspiracy in which he had entrapped the USA and the rest of the world, ready to pounce on and devour his victims, mankind. Emmanuel M. Josephson, The Federal Reserve Conspiracy and Rockefellers, 1968 Students are taught in schools and universities throughout the United States that the cause of World War I was the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, the heir to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, by a Serbian nationalist on June 28, 1914. The murder, according to this scenario, prompted conflict between Russia, Serbia's ally, and Germany, the Austro-Hungarian protector. This conflict caused the various European countries to fall like dominoes into the abyss of war, since they were bound by a network of alliances. A Matter of Oil But World War I, like all wars, was caused by economic interests, and plans for the global conflict were underway decades before the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand. The creation of the German Empire under Bismarck had upset the balance of powers that existed in Europe for more than two centuries. England ruled supreme over the continent until 1871. This supremacy had been repeatedly challenged by Spain and by France, but England always remained victorious. Because Germany grew increasingly stronger by acquiring colonies in Africa and by building up its military force, it became a severe threat to the economic hegemony of England. The threat was intensified when the German government obtained a concession from Sultan Abdul Hamid to drill the Baghdad Mosul oil fields and to build a Baghdad to Berlin railroad in 1904. The British government, by this time, was keenly aware that whoever controlled the oil controlled the future. As early as 1882, Admiral Lord Fisher stressed the importance of oil as the fuel for the Royal Navy by saying, The use of oil adds 50% to the value of any fleet that uses it. The use of oil would increase the strength of the British Navy by 33%, because it can refuel at any enemy's harbor. Coal necessitates about one-third of the fleet being absent at the refueling of a base. The Committee of 300 At that time, the international bankers, who were excluded from the economic development in Germany, sought for ways to limit and control Germany. Between 1894 and 1907, a number of international treaties were signed to have Russia, France, England, and other nations unite against Germany in the case of war. It was the task of the so-called Committee of 300 at the British Pilgrim Society to set the stage for world war. Members of the committee included Lord Albert Gray, Lord Arnold Toynbee, Lord Alfred Milner, and H.J. Mackinder, who became known as the father of geopolitics, Edward Bernays, the so-called father of public relations, and Walter Lippmann, the founding editor of the New Republic, were the American specialists of the committee. Lord Rothermere, a.k.a. Harold Harmsworth, used his newspaper, The Daily Mail, as a tool to try out their social conditioning techniques on his readers. After a test period of six months, they had found that 87% of the public had formed opinions without rational or critical thought processes. Thereupon, the English working class became subjected to a constant onslaught of propaganda, 
designed to convince them that they were obliged to send their sons by the millions to their deaths. The experiment verified that human beings can be conditioned as easily as rats. The Money Factory A war on the grand scale of World War I could not have been mounted without the establishment of the Federal Reserve System. The Fed, by churning out a seemingly endless supply of cash, could provide loans to foreign governments for the production of arms and munitions, chemicals, aircraft, tanks, submarines, and battleships. To make sure that the war would occur, Chase Manhattan and other Rockefeller banks, now flush with cash, provided Kaiser Wilhelm II with over $300 million. By 1917, the British War Office had borrowed $2.5 billion from Chase Manhattan and other Wall Street banks. Americans, without realizing it, were paying the bill for the massive produce of money through a hidden tax called inflation. The Possible Stalemate But a grave problem arose. By 1915, the Germans were emerging as victorious. They had nearly captured Paris, crushed Serbia and Romania, bled the French army until it mutinied, and vanquished the mighty Russian army. Even if the Germans did not attain victory, the possibility existed that the war could result in a stalemate. Since tanks were not manufactured until 1916, the armies had to rely on the infantries alone to stage an advance. But such advances were easily repelled, since both sides had dug trenches protected by machine guns, barbed wire, mines, and other obstacles. By 1916, the trenches had stretched over 400 miles from the Swiss border to the North Sea. American Isolationism It was becoming imperative for the money cartel to drag the United States into the conflict. But America stood as an isolationist nation. This was in keeping with the advice of George Washington, who said in his farewell address, The great rule of conduct for us in regard to foreign nations is in extending our commercial relations, to have with them as little political connection as possible. So far as we have already formed engagements, let them be fulfilled with perfect good faith. Here, let us stop. Europe has a set of primary interests which to us have none, or a very remote relation. Hence, she must be engaged in frequent controversies, the causes of which are essentially foreign to our concerns. Hence, therefore, it must be unwise in us to implicate ourselves by artificial ties in the ordinary vicissitudes of her politics, or the ordinary combinations and collisions of her friendships or enmities. Similarly, Thomas Jefferson, in his inaugural address, pledged peace, commerce, and honest friendship with all nations, entangling alliances with none. This tradition of isolationism was fortified by the millions of immigrants who came to America to escape from oppression. During the 1800s, the United States spanned North America without departing from its stance of isolationism. It fought the War of 1812, the Mexican War, and the Spanish-American War without forming foreign alliances or fighting on European soil. A Creditor Nation The problem of enticing the American government to the European slaughter was further compounded by the fact that Rockefeller, Morgan, and other members of the cartel were making a fortune by supporting both sides in the struggle. In 1915, Thomas W. Lamont, a partner of Morgan & Company, delivered the following speech to the American Academy of Political and Social Science in Philadelphia. We are turning from a debtor into a creditor. We are piling up prodigious export trade balance. Many of our manufacturers and merchants have been doing a wonderful business in articles relating to the war, World War I. So heavy have been the war orders running into the hundreds of millions of dollars that now their effect is beginning to spread to general business. This question of trade and financial supremacy must be determined by several factors, 
a chief one of which is the duration of the war. If the war should come to an end in the near future, we should probably find Germany, whose export trade is now almost wholly caught off, swinging back into keen competition very promptly. Another factor that is dependent on the duration of the war is as to whether we shall become lenders to foreign nations upon a really large scale. Shall we become lenders upon a really stupendous scale to these foreign governments? If the war continues long enough to encourage us to take such a position, then inevitably we would become a creditor instead of a debtor nation, and such a development, sooner or later, would tend to bring about the dollar instead of the pound sterling as the international basis of exchange. The money began to flow in January of 1915, when the House of Morgan signed a contract with the British Army Council and the Admiralty. At the advent of modern warfare, the first purchase, curiously, was for horses, and the amount tendered was $12 million. But that was but the first drop in the banker's bucket. Total purchases from the Allies eventually climbed to an astronomical $3 billion. Morgan's office at 23 Wall Street became mobbed by brokers and manufacturers seeking to cut a deal. Each month, Jack Morgan presided over purchases that equaled the gross national product of the entire world just one generation before. The British Concession The problem of securing America's involvement in the struggle was solved by Winston Churchill, the first Lord of the Admiralty. Churchill persuaded David Lloyd George, the British Prime Minister, and other leading members of the government to yield to the money cartel's demand that the British concede their claims to the rich oil fields of Saudi Arabia, one of the empire's vassal countries, to the Rockefellers. In exchange for this concession, the Rockefellers and other cartel members would participate in staging events that would bring America's doughboys to the killing fields of France a manufactured atrocity. An incident had to be manufactured, which would provoke the American people to abandon their stance of isolationism and to enter the fracas. It came with the sinking of the Lusitania by a German submarine on May 7, 1915. When the ship went down, 1,198 civilians, including 128 Americans, died and the seemingly unprovoked act of aggression against a passenger ocean liner served to arouse anti-German sentiment throughout the country. Many of the 767 survivors popped up and down in the waves for three hours, while seagulls swooped from the sky to peck out the eyes of the floating corpses. Few Americans realized that the sinking and delayed rescue had been planned by Winston Churchill and that members of the British Admiralty were acting in tandem with Britain's Board of Trade, including Colonel Edward M. House of the Wilson administration and American industrialists, along with J.P. Morgan, who had provided massive loans to Great Britain and the Allied forces. The American public was not informed that the Lusitania was transporting six million rounds of ammunition and other military munitions to Britain. Upon the order of President Wilson, the ship's original manifest was hidden away in the archives of the Treasury Department. Nor were they made aware that Churchill and other members of the Admiralty had directed the Lusitania to proceed at considerably reduced speed and without escort to the precise location within the Irish Sea where the German U-boat was lying in wait. And the public, for the most part, remained oblivious that the Germans had placed large ads in the New York newspapers to dissuade Americans from boarding the ocean liner. Fake News After the sinking of the Lusitania, stories about German atrocities began to capture headlines in U.S. newspapers, including the New York Times. One story reported that German soldiers were deliberately mutilating Belgian babies by cutting off their hands, and in some cases, even eating them. Another atrocity story involved a Canadian soldier who had supposedly been crucified with bayonets by the Germans. Many Canadians claimed to have witnessed the event, yet they all provided different versions of how it had happened. 
The Canadian High Command investigated the matter. 